Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Value of SOC 2 Certification. Service Organization Controls or SOC reports are on the rise in the IT, insurance and compliance world. It's important for organizations to understand what the reports are, how to repair for an audit so that you can better plan for and navigate an audit in order to achieve a successful result. And that's exactly what we're going to cover in today's webinar. Now, before we get started and I turn it over to our two presenters, I just want to remind everyone of a couple of housekeeping rules. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent out at the end of the webinar. Attendees are in listen-only mode, but please feel free to submit your questions via the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be doing a live Q&A at the end of this webinar, where we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Now, it's time over to our presenters. Hey everyone, this is David Hall from Ascendio. A little background on me, I've got over 25 years of experience in the technology industry at both the practitioner and management levels, supporting a wide range of commercial and government clients. This has included project management, system engineering, software development, software as a service, cybersecurity, in addition to compliance. So I've most likely been in your shoes. I've led and performed numerous assessments and audits against most of the major statutory, regulatory, privacy, and industry best practice compliance requirements, such as SOC 2, who we're going to talk about today, HIPAA, PCI, NIST 853, NIST 800-171, FedRAMP, ISO 27001, and SOX. In addition to performing assessments, I specialize in preparing organizations to successfully go through these assessments, as well as supporting post-assessment remediation activities. Over to you, Mike. Hey, this is Mike Malloy. I'm a manager in the IT risk advisory uh, practice at Clearview Group. Uh, we're a management consulting and CPA firm based out of Owens Mills, Maryland. Um, we uh, specialize in internal audit, Sarbanes-Oxley consulting, security audits and assessments, and as well, um, as, you know, as we're talking about today, uh, SOC 2 readiness and audit engagements. So looking at um, kind of the next slide here, the overview of the, the different types of SOC reports, and this is where things, you know, tend to get a little bit confusing at first. Uh, there's a lot of numbers involved in the different types of reporting. Um, as you can see in the table here, uh, we have three different main types of SOC reports. Um, they're all under the guidance under, of the AICPA. Uh, the first one is primarily focused on financial reporting. So this uh, type of report would, would look at a company's processes around uh, their financial statements and financial controls, primarily used uh, by auditors, uh, external auditors, financial statement auditors. Um, this comes up a lot if you're a public company doing a Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, likely you'll have to kind of collect these SOC 1 reports for um, your various vendors that you're working with. And, and again, this provides the assurance of your financial statements. The SOC 2 that we're talking about today is uh, broken up into five main principles, uh, security, availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. Uh, companies have the choice, uh, if you're a service organization, to uh, address one or all of those uh, principles. Um, every SOC 2 report will include the security principle, which is part of what they call the common criteria. And then you can choose to add, like I said, uh, any of the additional four uh, criteria, depending on your business needs and, and what your clients are asking for. Uh, the main audience for the SOC 2 report is, is much more broad than uh, the SOC 1. Um, these are gonna be service organizations, customers, uh, internal management, regulators, and uh, various other third parties, which may also include uh, you know, external audit firms as well. The SOC 3 report is uh, very much uh, similar to the SOC 2 report, although it is meant to be a, a much more public document. The SOC 2 report uh, is proprietary and confidential. It does not include a uh, very kind of specific uh, narrative around internal controls related to access management, change management, security. The SOC 3 uh, kind of scrubs out a lot of the detail and really just sticks to the opinion of the, uh, the SOC uh, auditor. Um, so this gives companies the, avail the ability to provide uh, an opinionated report uh, to prospective clients or, you know, other uh, folks, even, you know, just putting it out on the website without giving them too much of the proprietary information that might, uh, they might not want to share publicly. 
the next slide, kind of looking at the details around the SOC 2 report. So um, since we're focusing in on that today, we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into uh, what really kind of makes up the SOC 2 report. So the, uh, the main thing here is that this is for, the SOC 2 report is issued by um, the service organiza organization in conjunction with a CPA firm um, where they're actually providing an opinion over the design and operating effectiveness of controls depending on the type of SOC 2. And this is where, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of the numbers and, and things start to get a little bit confusing. So for the, the SOC 2, there are two different types. Uh, type 1 is a point-in-time assessment. So this report would be issued as of a specific date and it is an assessment over the design of controls uh, at the service organization. So it's really a, a snapshot in time um, and, and only looks at you know, things like policies and procedures and um, you know, kind of narrative around controls. Uh, it focuses a lot on that system description, um, which is again, management's uh, narrative around what their product and service entails the controls related to access and change and uh, security and so on and so forth. The type two report uh, covers a period of time. So the report would be issued uh, to look at operating effectiveness over a, a period of time, typically within the, I would say most of them are a 12 month period, although they can be shorter. Um, the, the shortest engagement we would typically see would be about three to four months. So this is where the auditors would not only come in and look at the design of controls, so the policies and procedures and so on and so forth, but also did those controls operate effectively over a period of time in the past? So a report, if you were to do a type two report for all of 2017, um, the auditors would likely come in you know, shortly thereafter and then uh, provide the report after they've done their assessment. And then as the service organization, you would be able to communicate that report sometime in you know, early 2018 to cover that period of the previous year. Um, so it's a, it's a deeper dive. It definitely provides uh, much more assurance and most uh, of the clients of service organizations that are asking for SOC reports do want the type two because it has uh, you know, the actual tests that were performed and, and just a, a more rigorous examination of the controls. So moving on to the next slide around the five trust service principles, I think uh, yeah, so you're going to cover this one. Yeah, so this is David. So yeah, as Mike said, there's really kind of five, or there's really five areas that a SOC 2 can be made up in. Uh, of AICPA calls those trust service principles, but really you can just think of it as five kind of buckets of criteria. And criteria are very specific controls that you need to meet uh, or that you'll be assessed against. So I'm just going to kind of go through each one. Uh, at a fairly high level because there's a lot of a lot of detail common criteria uh, or also known as security that's kind of your core uh, things you have to do and, and to Mike's point uh, you do have the option to not having your audit uh, have all five of these but all audits have to have this one so this is things like organizational controls for example having a security officer assigned uh, access management uh, that would include physical access or do you have the controls around making sure uh, how you provision users, deprovision users, things like that. Uh, risk management, uh, identifying risks, including fraud, uh, performing risk assessments, and uh, making sure that once you've identified your risk, you're managing it or remediating them properly. Uh, change management, this would be against the software application and all supporting infrastructure. Are changes going in a structured way? Do you have a good SDLC? Uh, some other uh, of the areas that are not listed here uh, are monitoring, which is just making sure your controls are working, communications, making sure everybody knows what the responsibilities are, and system operations, which is really where uh, incident management comes in. Availability is what you would expect it to be. Again, from your client's perspective, they want to make sure this is going to be up and running when they want to use it. Uh, so it includes your environmental controls. You know, you have fire suppression, things like that. Most people do that by uh, contracting with a data center or, a, or a information as an infrastructure provider. Your system recovery, your data backup and recovery. And a third one, which sometimes is a new one for people, is capacity management. And that's just making sure you're forecasting into the future that the system's going to be able to keep up with demand. Again, from your client's perspective, they want to make sure that system is available when they want to use it. Um, processing integrity. Uh, that's really 
uh, your client, again, wants to make sure that if they're using you to process their data, you have controls in place to ensure the accuracy and integrity of the processing, also the data flowing in and out of the system. Uh, confidentiality, again, that's one most people are familiar with. Basically, you want to keep people from seeing client data that are not authorized to see it. This is usually where encryption comes in. A big area of emphasis here is how you're dealing with your third party uh, vendors. Mike mentioned that about kind of SOC 2s flowing up and down the chain. Um, and then finally, privacy. Privacy really only comes into play if you're holding uh, health data or uh, PII. Uh, that brings in quite a few more criteria, and we don't see a huge number of people biting off privacy. It's, it's fairly complex. Again, the takeaway here is there are five defined areas, and uh, you have to do common criteria, and then you can make a decision as to which other ones you want to make you want to do. So again, to that to that point, obviously uh, we've kind of designed this slide to show you how big each piece is in terms of the number of actual criteria or controls you have to meet. If you bite, the more you bite off, the more work it's going to be. The more expensive the prep work is going to be, the more expensive and time it's going to take for a company like Mike's to come in and perform the assessment. Um, so that's just something you really need to think about. Sometimes it's better to kind of walk before you run, especially depending on the maturity of your organization, uh, how long you've had kind of a security organization in place. And then also it's going to depend tremendously on, on why you're doing the SOC too. If, if your clients are asking for something very specific, you may not have the option. You may have to bite off more of these. Um, but it's definitely a key piece to look at. Uh, I see all the time uh, that people kind of bite off more than they can chew. Uh, this is going to be something we'll talk about this later. You're going to have to do on an annual basis. So the first year you could just do common criteria. The second year you could add in availability or, or whatever. So uh, next slide. So why do a SOC 2? Obviously, you guys all came in and, and dedicated your time today. And really, it, it, it mostly we see it's driven by clients. The clients are coming to you and say, hey, we want to see your SOC 2. So that really is the overriding reason for doing it. Um, sometimes it also comes from internal management as a way to uh, get a feel for where their security situation is. It does support your overall compliance. Uh, it can also support you a lot of uh, organizations when they enter into a new relationship or they're starting to enter into a new relationship with a client. They send you a very detailed security questionnaire. Uh, this can kind of help you get through that. Sometimes the SOC 2 can obviate your need to uh, answer all those questions. Uh, you know, it, it builds trust with your third parties as it shows you're being serious about your, what you're doing. It can be a competitive differentiator. So if you've done this and your competitors have not, I hear this a lot from people in the VP of sales and the sales organization. Uh, again, you know, oftentimes it's, it's part of the process for getting a new client. And again, as I said, internal management, uh, it helps them get visibility into where things stand. They're not always experts in the compliance and security area. So it gives them a kind of a, a good thing to look at to feel comfortable about that. Uh, next slide. Yes, when we look at, um, you know, kind of the different standards and so on and so forth that make up the uh, the potential controls that could support SOC 2, um, obviously you'll see a lot of familiar, uh, you know, frameworks and uh, and regulations here. Uh, the latest version of the, the SOC 2 guidance actually does incorporate COSO, um, which is a pretty common um, framework. There's a, basically a collection of, of organizations that, that build out that, that framework, including the AICPA and the Institute, Institute of Internal Auditors. Uh, but the key here is that you know, your company, if you're not currently getting a SOC 2, um, but you're exploring you know, what it would take to do that, if you're already getting another type of you know, high trust certification, ISO 27001, you may actually have a lot of the components and controls in place needed to address the SOC 2 as well. Um, and that's where, you know, the mapping exercise of, you know, we've already kind of allocated uh, all the processes and the people and, the, and all the artifacts as part of our audits for one of these other standards. Well, usually the mapping exercise isn't that difficult to get into kind of the SOC 2 framework. So, and we, we see a lot of our clients that um, they actually will pursue uh, obtaining multiple certifications all at once. So it's not uncommon that a company will, will want to get a SOC 2 report and ISO 27001 all as part of the same activity. So then you can kind of, 
you know, get a lot of efficiencies in, you know, the types of information you're sending over because there is that overlap between the standards. And then looking at the structure of the SOC 2 report specifically, um, there are four main sections. There's, there's a fifth optional section that isn't all that commonly introduced. Um, but the main thing uh, here is that the, the SOC 2 report is really a communication from the service organization to their clients um, of what, what makes up the control. So when we look at, uh, you know, just start with section two, for example, the assertion of the client, this is a statement that um, is signed by leadership within the service organization that says that everything we've included in our description of the system is complete and accurate and we haven't omitted any information that would be pertinent or material to the audit. Um, and then section one is where the CPA firm actually, you know, has again another statement that is signed by the company, um, by the CPA firm that says, uh, you know, here's all the details of what we did in the report. For this report, what was the period that we covered? Um, did we note any uh, exceptions? What is our opinion, which is a very key element in the report, the opinion of the CPA firm? Um, and we'll get into some of the detail of what the differences are there. Uh, section three, uh, as I mentioned, is the, the description of the system. This is typically a, a narrative. Uh, there is no prescriptive guidance on how it should be constructed, although there is um, some guidance, and I'll share that later from the AICPA on, on what that should look like. Um, typically, we see that that is in the, the realm of about seven to 15 pages long. Um, it can include graphics such as network diagrams or process flows for the, the product or service. Um, and it's going to include all the narratives around, you know, what types of controls are in place uh, that address the criteria um, as we mentioned earlier, the common criteria or criteria related to any additional principles included. Section four is the all of the criteria from the AICPA listed out specifically. Um, in addition to that, it will have the client control. So the, the service organization will say for you know criteria 1.1, here is what we are doing specifically, the people, processes, and technology. And then um, very key to this for the top, the, the type two report, it will also include the description of the tests performed by the CPA firm, as well as their findings, uh, which would be something like no exceptions noted, or there were exceptions noted, then usually they will elaborate a, a bit on, you know, the type of thing that they found there. And then, as I mentioned, there's that fifth section, that is a kind of free form uh, narrative that management can provide that is not within the scope of the opinion of the auditor. So this typically includes some other information about maybe changes to the business um, that they want to just communicate to their clients. But again, it, um, it's very clearly kind of a separate piece that the auditor has not reviewed, uh, you know, any of the controls or statements within that, uh, that section. And then when you're preparing for a SOC 2 audit from the CPA firm's perspective, I mean, the, the key things that you're going to want to know uh, before you kind of reach out is, uh, you know, what, wh who are your stakeholders? Um, who are you really communicating to? Um, a lot of companies offer multiple products and services. So you may want to define which of those products and services you want to have in scope for the SOC 2 review. Um, you know, as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, you, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew that first go round. So you may choose kind of one core piece of business that you feel is, uh, you know, very well kind of matured as far as controls go and then kind of scope that in. Uh, the other important thing here would be the uh, reporting period. As I mentioned earlier, typically four to 12 months uh, looking back. Uh, usually companies, if they're starting with the four month, um, they have a plan to kind of expand that into an annual process. Um, just from a cost and benefit perspective, it, it is much better to do an annual review. Um, but if it's your first time, you know, getting the report, you know, you may not have 12 months that are kind of clean, so to speak, to look back on. Um, as I mentioned, the scope, so that would be really the description of the system, making sure that management has taken the time to write out that description. Um, and then thought about the, the types of, or the principles that would, you would like to be included in the report. Um, and then uh, Dave will kind of explain a little bit about uh, some specific activities you can do as far as preparing or do a, a, an assessment to prepare for the SOC 2 report.
Yeah, so it's very important before you even engage a CPA firm to make sure you kind of know where you stand. So highly, highly recommend that you do a gap analysis or a readiness assessment of kind of, kind of a gray area between the two of those. And really, you can easily get hold of the AICPA uh, criteria. Just go right to the AICPA site and get it. And I highly recommend you use that to go through and do a self-readiness assessment or bring in an outside firm that specializes in helping people get ready. Go through criteria by criteria. You know, determine where you stand. Are you really doing what, what AICPA wants you to be doing? That can also help you significantly in deciding which of the trust, trust principles you pick. Let's say you go through your readiness and you're doing great in security, but maybe you still have some work to do in one of the other areas. Maybe that's one to leave out in the first year and tackle that the second year. Um, so you really got to get also, as you go through that process, inevitably you're going to find out that you're not where you thought you were. This is, I would say, 100% of the organizations I work with. So you need to give yourself some time to put things in place before you have the audit performed. So you don't want to go into an audit knowing you've got a lot of things that aren't working because the, you know, the, the guys like Mike and on his team are really good at their job. They're going to, they're going to figure that out. Um, and you do need to get that system description together. Uh, you'll get some feedback from your auditor on that. You have a little bit of ability to mess around with that. And again, a lot of times it's kind of hard to do this yourself. You're too close to it. So what people do is either bring in a third party uh, person to come in or firm to come in and take a look at this for you. You can actually use the auditor. So the auditor can actually have an engagement to come in and make recommendations. They just can't actually make any changes or execute any controls on your behalf because uh, they have to maintain their independence. But again, this pre, this preparation, and this, this can be a multi-month process, is key to the success of the audit. Uh, next slide. Um, so really at a high level, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the framework, which is really just the list of, of criteria or controls that an AICPA uh, needs you to meet. Map that to what you're currently doing. So the, the control the control criteria may say something like, you know, you you perform an annual review of all users that have access to a system. So you need to go and say, what controls do we have in place? What policies do we have? What procedures do we have? You know, what documentation do we have of what we're actually doing? Uh, and you need to document where you have those gaps, and then you need to embark on a remediation plan. You know, what do we need to do to fix that? You've got to go to your management and ask for resources, time, et cetera. Um, and uh, the one we've called out specifically here is, is looking at fraud because this is a, a new requirement. So as you're going through this assessment, uh, especially in the risk assessment area, you need to, you need to look at, at how fraud impacts that. That's not typically something I see that people in the security realm take a look at, uh, but obviously from a, from a AICPA perspective, that's key to them. And again, you've got to allow time. So I know a lot of times it's, it's pushed onto the practitioner, the manager says, oh my gosh, uh, we've got this opportunity with this big client. They say we need to have a SOC too. We need to get this done in two weeks. Not really doable. You need to allow sufficient time because if you do a sloppy job, like I said, the guys on Mike's team, they're, they're going to find you out. And it's just kind of you know, wasted your time to do that. Uh, next slide. Yep. And when we dive into kind of the, the process of the audit itself, um, we typically see that this takes, you know, anywhere from one to two months to actually execute the, the audit work. Um, and as Dave mentioned, you know, starting with the audit planning, um, we would as the CPA firm come in and, and do a brief review of the system description. Um, you know, we definitely encourage our SOC 2 audit clients um, to either engage us for the readiness assessment or to perform that themselves to make sure that the system description is in a pretty mature state. Um, we, we actually would be precluded from even performing the audit engagement per AICPA guidelines if the system description wasn't even created at, you know, at the start of the, of the uh, audit. Um, we would, as part of planning as well, you know, talk with, uh, with management, key stakeholders, uh, SMEs within the organization, uh, to get a sense of the layout of the, the controls based on the description, um, the tools, the processes in place. And then uh, jumping into sort of the field work phase, this is where we're really going in and we're, uh, you know, kind of submitting those evidence request lists out to management, asking for documentation, user lists, vulnerability scan results, um, policies, procedures, all the things that are kind of stated within the description that uh, the service organization does, we would want to go in and then take a look and make sure that it exists. And again, 
type one report, we're going to be focusing on uh, just kind of very high level. Do we do we believe that the design of the control is in place? And then for the type two report, we would actually collect evidence throughout the opinion period. So we would ask for, for example, um, if you have a monthly control related to scanning internal systems for vulnerabilities, we would uh, either select a sample or request all of the uh, results of those scans throughout the, the prior year if it's a 12-month if it's a 12 -month, uh, audit period. Uh, during this time, we will also be performing tests internally based on that evidence, uh, and this is where we would kind of start to come up with our opinion uh, related to whether there were exceptions or not. Um, our practice is always to communicate very quickly with management if, we, if there's anything that we think might be an exception um, and, and definitely talk through that. So there's, there's always a conversation that happens about to make sure that we have all the facts straight. Um, and of course, management would have the opportunity uh, and multiple times to review the draft report before it's finally signed and, and executed and sent over um, to, to leadership within the organization. Um, during field work, we would also have some follow-up requests. If you've ever been part of any audit, a lot of this is gonna sound very familiar. Um, like I said, when we get to the reporting phase, um, we pull together the, the draft report, we send that out, um, we make sure that everything's kind of look, looks good, that we've you know, communicated everything accurately. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of wrap up exercises towards the end where there's documents that need to be signed and dated by um, specific people within the organization. Uh, then we have to kind of collect all of those together and we issue the final report. The final report is sent directly to the service organization. Um, as a CPA firm, we do not uh, by practice communicate that to the clients of the service organization. That is up to the company that we're issuing the SOC 2 report for to communicate it. Uh, diving a little bit into the collection of evidence, uh, this is where you know that readiness exercise really becomes important because the you do want to keep the, the actual audit timing uh, to be within that one to two month period. The, if it takes a long time to kind of pull together the evidence and the documents that we're asking for, then it just kind of delays the issuance of the report. And for a lot of our clients, um, they have very specific deadlines with their customers on when those reports must be submitted. Some of those are even contractual obligations. So we want to make sure that you know, that process is very efficient and smooth and that um, everybody on the service organization side is kind of ready to prepare these documents. And again, that's where, um, you know, certainly the readiness assessment and having a tool that can kind of keep all this evidence in a central place is, is very important. Um, some examples, uh, as we mentioned, you know, org charts, uh, job descriptions, uh, an inventory of information assets, uh, employee onboarding and offboarding, access provisioning, uh, policies, procedures, network diagrams, uh, change management. For, for that, we'd, we would look for things like um, if it's a you know, software solution that's being developed that, that's in scope, we would look at the number of releases uh, for the opinion period and then kind of look at all of the artifacts that support um, the approval, the, the quality assurance testing of the code, the scanning of code, uh, for vulnerabilities, all of that kind of evidence to ensure that the change management process is working uh, appropriately. And the, the real takeaway here is that um, as auditors, um, you know, we have to trust but verify and uh, documentation is key that, you know, it, it needs to be available. It needs to be kind of well constructed um, because if we can't collect that evidence, then we uh, cannot provide the opinion that you know, the control is existing or operating effectively for the period. So when we get to the, the reporting phase, there's, there's a, a number of opinions um, that can be issued or types of opinions. So the, everyone is kind of shooting for the, the unqualified opinion. This basically means that the, in the auditor or the CPA firm's opinion, uh, the controls were uh, designed and operating effectively uh, for the you know, period of time with which the, the report is issued for. Um, qualified opinions are not uncommon and they're, they're not necessarily a, a bad thing. Uh, a qualified opinion just basically means that you know, everything was designed and operating effectively except for a few kind of immaterial 
things that, that were found. And these could be, you know, maybe we're looking at a user access list for a very, you know, core system. And there were a couple of people that had left the company, but they retained access for a few weeks after they left. Um, but we didn't see any evidence that they had actually even logged into the system. Then there would be an exception kind of noted in the table in section four, but, you know, we would, it would be a qualified opinion, but it wouldn't be, um, you know, a very material thing. And, and usually, you know, with these types of exceptions, um, your customers are going to be kind of understanding of that. Nobody's perfect. Um, and there's, there's definitely, you know, things that can, that can go uh, a little bit wrong throughout the year, but it's, it's a transparent exercise. Um, the one that's not listed on here because it is very rare um, and usually results in um, the service organization deciding to not to continue to pursue the report would be what we call an adverse opinion. An adverse opinion is uh, either there's a specific exception or a collection of exceptions which, are, which materially impact the, the state of controls and the criteria. So in that case, uh, you know, that would definitely raise uh, some red flags. And um, usually what ends up happening there is that uh, the service organization doesn't want to have uh, an adverse opinion on a SOC 2 report. So they just decide to kind of not even have the report and just go out to their customers and say, look, we, you know, we realize that there's some, some work we need to do. Um, and we're going to remediate that and then start to pursue, pursue the SOC 2 at a later date. And Mike, let me just jump in there real quick. So this is this yep. really ties to that readiness. So if you go through, you should have a pretty good idea of where you stand. Obviously, you're you're not a you know you're not an information system auditor like Mike and his team are. But um, I I typically and I can't speak for Mike. Typically, have seen those bad opinions when somebody just kind of jumped in and really you know, would have been clearly shown that they weren't ready. So at that point, you're just wasting time and money. So again, pre-assessment, pre-assessment, pre-assessment. Back to you, Mike. Yep, exactly. And and the reason I think these are rare too is because we we definitely encourage any new SOC 2 clients of ours to do that readiness exercise. Um, and by encourage, I mean very strongly encourage them to do that. Um, and that's where it just reduces that risk of an adverse opinion uh, pretty significantly. So... Uh, looking at the SOC 3, so as I mentioned earlier on, the, the SOC 3 is that publicly available um, report. Uh, typically, the I'll say SOC 3s aren't all that common, but if they are issued, they are usually issued in conjunction with the SOC 2. So a company will go in and they'll get the SOC 2 report, and then they'll ask their CPA firm auditor to additionally um, issue the SOC 3, which is Basically, all the same testing that was performed for the SOC 2 would, would it would be the same testing, same engagement. It's all it is is a different final deliverable with the sensitive information kind of scrubbed out of it. So it's it's much more general use. You can put it on your website. But what we typically see is that um, companies are uh, kind of just sticking with the SOC 2 because their main audience is existing clients and customers with which they have, you know, NDAs in place or, or whatever. And, and they're, they obviously, their clients have a vested interest in the systems um, and they're being transparent with all the details around um, the description of their systems and controls. All right, challenges of obtaining a SOC 2 report from the service organization's perspective, that being your company. Uh, first of all, once you start doing this, your clients are going to start asking for it every year. So it's an annual reassessment. You can't rest on your laurels. Once you get one behind you, you pretty much immediately need to start planning for the next years, especially if you're going to add more service principles. Um, resource allocation. This is also a big one. A lot of times management doesn't understand how much uh, time and effort it's going to take to, to get everything ready and to go through the audit itself. You need to budget that for the current year. You need to budget that for upcoming years. A lot of times it's IT personnel that gets sucked into this. They've got lots of other stuff to do, so you really need to think about how that impacts your, your organization. And speaking of that, organizational buy-in. Um, you know, you're going to have to have changes in a lot of cases where you're not doing something that's required by SOC 2 or you're not doing it in the manner uh, that's required. So, again, this takes some time. Uh, this may require changes in areas of the organization that you personally don't control. Let's say you're in the, you know, you're in the IT group or the compliance group, and those changes have to happen, for example, in the software development group. 
that requires upper management to kind of push that down there. Um, selection of the trust service principles, we've kind of kind of beaten this one to death a little bit, but uh, you really need to make a decision year by year. You may decide to only do the security principles in year one. You may have some of your clients come back and say that's not sufficient, and then in year two, you'll need to decide what you need to add. Uh, the last one, of course, we've been hitting it, document, document, document. A lot of times I see organizations are actually doing a good job at doing the controls but they just don't have a good paper trail to show that they're doing the controls. And, and to Mike's point, if they can't see evidence that you're doing it, they have to assume that you're not doing it. They can't just take your word for it. That's where Astendia is my VCM product can come into in handy. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit, but it keeps all the documentation, it keeps the workflow, captures all the approvals and things like that. Uh, so something like that is very important to have in place. Uh, next slide. Um, tips for success, I think by now you should understand, definitely have to do that readiness uh, assessment, gap analysis, uh, you can also do a risk assessment at the same time there. Um, Mike mentioned this report, you're the one paying for the report, you're the service organization, they're going to issue your report, um, you're the ones that are going to share it with your clients or others that, that you deem need to get it, you need to make sure you understand what's in that report. Uh, some of that goes into the back and forth with the auditor kind of towards the end, as Mike mentioned about, you know, what's really going to be in there. But at that point, you know, it's, it may not say only good things. There may be some bad things in there as well. So when you give it to somebody, you need to be prepared for questions to come, come up with that uh, documentation. Absolutely. Uh, doing those internal reviews, uh, time for remediation. Um, and you, again, you, you basically got to be able to prove that what you say you're doing is doing. Having it written in a policy is not sufficient. Having somebody say they're doing it's not sufficient. And this can't just be driven by the IT group or the compliance group or internal audit if you're a little bigger organization. You really need to have senior management buy-in for this. Um, you'll definitely get buy-in from the sales side because it's in their best interest to have this happen. But if you don't have senior management buy-in, it can be challenging to implement some of these changes in your organization you need to do in order to be ready for the audit. Next slide. So looking at the, the SOC 2 guides, I, I think this slide kind of demonstrates a little bit the complexity that really kind of lays behind um, the report and, and the requirements that are baked into it. So I'm not going to go through you know, each of these, but these are all things issued by the AICPA that are you know, kind of specific to uh, or related to the SOC 2. Uh, the key one being really the, the Trust Service Principles 100, TSP 100. Um, this is the, the document that specifies what all of the criteria are, what their points of focus are. Um, so if you want to see what the criteria you would have to address if you were to obtain a SOC 2, that's the document you would, you would go and obtain. Um, the other thing to note here is that I believe every single one of these requirements changed at some point either last year or this year. So the key is to be proactive about understanding and staying on top of these changes um, so that you know that you're, you're using the latest versions, that as you're getting the audit performed year over year, that you're keeping on top of these changes so you can adapt your processes, documentation, or controls to make sure you're meeting the latest requirements. And uh, this is where the CPA firm and your audit firm can really come in handy. Um, with all of our clients, we're very proactive about making sure that we communicate with them about any changes that are coming up so that they can address those well before uh, we actually come in and do the audit. So making sure you have a good partner relationship with the, uh, the audit firm is, is very important to stay on top of that. So looking at the, the cost of a SOC 2 assessment, it, there's, there's a number of things that kind of come into play here. Obviously, there's a, a direct cost of actually performing the audit with the CPA firm. Um, but I would say predominantly a lot of the cost is going to be in kind of the readiness portion uh, and not necessarily the assessment itself. Those tend to not be um, terribly expensive depending on you know, what, what the scope of services are there. But it's really getting um, the organization uh, to buy in and, and really start to perform those controls. So there's going to be a lot of kind of uh, costs related to internal resources, depending on the level of maturity in your organization around IT and information security. Um, 
speaking specifically on the report, some of the things that will affect the price, obviously the, the size and complexity of the products and services that are in scope um, would require additional time from the CPA firm and would, would increase the, uh, the price. Um, the other thing would be kind of the, the size of the organization. So um, as the audit firm is collecting evidence around the org chart and access list, the more people that you have kind of in those systems, the, the greater the risk that there's going to be, um, you know, some sort of a, a control gap there. Um, and obviously the, the, the higher le the level of testing that would have to be performed, which would increase uh, kind of the, the cost there. Uh, the hosting model does have some effect on the cost. Um, sometimes it increases the cost, sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't. Um, one thing that we, we see a lot, you know, the, the industry, uh, a lot of companies are moving to that infrastructure as a service, software as a service model. Uh, if you're using AWS or Microsoft Azure to host your systems, then um, there are ways that you can, uh, the term is to carve out the controls that th that that service organization is providing to you so you can reduce some of the costs because there's you're not managing the infrastructure of those systems and you're basically going to communicate to your clients that um, you are relying on the controls of your vendor whether it be AWS or Salesforce or any other uh, provider like that um, so you can you can actually that can benefit you if you're using those cloud service models um, thinking about the, the length of time, uh, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier as far as, you know, the, how long it can take. Um, really, the, the readiness of the organization, the organization of the documentation, these are all going to affect the, the timeliness of the audit. Um, you, you definitely want to have kind of all your ducks in a row before you start the engagement so that that can be kind of turned around very quickly and, and efficiently. Um, when looking to select an audit firm, there's a few things that are re certainly required. Um, they must be a licensed CPA firm. Um, things you're going to want to kind of look at and consider is who's on the audit team? What type of experience does that, do those individuals have? Um, do they, have they only ever done kind of SOC 2 compliance or do they have experience in, you know, other parts of information security? internal audit, uh, so on and so forth. So really thinking about the competency of the audit firm and the team that's uh, kind of being proposed. Uh, the other thing is the peer review. So uh, every CPA firm that is issuing SOC 2 re reports must be peer reviewed every three years. Uh, so uh, for example, Clearview, we just uh, went through our peer review last year. Um, and you're going to want to kind of ask the audit firm, have you been peer reviewed? What were the re results of that? Um, the big thing here is that the peer review uh, is really the, the check and balance on the CPA firm. Are they doing all the right things that they are required to do? Are they keeping their work papers? Are they doing their due diligence? Are they issuing reports in compliance with AICPA guidelines? And this is where, um, you know, for the peer review standpoint, if the CPA firm is not doing their job correctly, then the peer reviewer will actually has the authority to kind of uh, remove their ability to perform SOC 2 reports um, in the future. Uh, again, check the independence. So the CPA firm should definitely not be saying, oh yeah, we can come in and help you implement new technologies and do a bunch of consulting and, uh, you know, design controls for you and do all that. that all of that stuff would be uh, not allowed as part of the audit relationship. As Dave mentioned earlier, the CPA firm absolutely can come in and do the readiness assessment. They can provide recommendations and advisory, but ultimately the decision on whether to perform those recommendations would be up to the service organization's management. And then, uh, you know, just speaking specifically about Clearview Group, um, obviously we check, you know, all the boxes in, in, the, in the previous slide. Um, and really the thing that I, I think is a great differentiator for us is that we we really, we do SOC 2 as well, but we do a lot of other stuff um, in this space as, as well, um, including, you know, information security consulting, technology consulting, um, internal audit and risk advisory. And one of the big things that we, uh, you know, like to add value in this process when we do these SOC 2 audits is providing recommendations and observations for how um, our clients, the service organization, can improve their controls in the future um, and, and really present a, a, a much higher quality report to their clients, which will just 
benefit everyone. So um, we really do, you know, like to take the time to do that, and we, we find that that's very uh, good for our clients. All right, as far as summary, um, you know, going through this process, which can be fairly onerous and a lot of work, but it does force you to put the right things in place, and ultimately that's what you want to do. You don't want to be in a situation where uh, you're processing data or providing a service to a client and, you know, you let them down. That, that's a problem for the business. It's a problem for your client. So this really makes you, and it gives you structure to do that. So if you're not sure exactly what you should be doing, you can use the SOC 2 structure. Um, another thing, as I keep saying, you've got to document everything. Uh, that's actually good for your internal processes as well when you're checking to make sure uh, those are working correctly and absolutely required as you go through any kind of audit or assessment. Um, you know, technology can help automate many of the controls. You should be looking to do that as much as possible, as little paper as possible. Um, planning and preparation, as we said, is critical. You don't want to walk into a, an audit situation not really having a good understanding of where you stand. Uh, you really, the auditor will tell you where you stand, but you want to kind of have that understanding 90%. If they're finding really more than 10% of what you don't know, that's, that can be a bit of a problem. Uh, if you do have an internal audit function, uh, that can that can help you to reduce your costs as you're going into, into this process. Um, next slide. So Stendia is my VCM. Everybody may not be familiar with that, but it's an online system uh, to help you go through these processes as far as your information security governance, going through audits and assessment. You know, everything you do is documented. The processes are automated. It's it's workflow management so that you can assign tasks to people. For example, if everybody needs to take the information security awareness training, you can set that up as a task in my VCM. And then as people take the training, uh, when they sign into the system, you know who's taken it, who hasn't taken it. So if you need to ding people but they haven't taken it, it's right there. Uh, again, it tracks all those tasks. So anybody that has an outstanding task, whether that be an access review, you know, recertification, whatever, it tasks all that. Um, it's going to save you significant time and cost as far as any kind of reporting that you have to perform for the audit. So a lot of times Mike's group is going to come in and say, hey, we need a report of all the users that have access to XYZ. That's something that can be automated in, in my BCM. Um, and it helps you schedule, track, and, and manage the audit activities. Um, so it's a system that's purpose-built for these type of situations. Um, okay. Next slide. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much for that very knowledgeable presentation. So we have a couple of great questions that come in. So Mike, I'm going to give this one to you. So we got a question that says, what's the additional cost to service organizations for getting a SOC 3 report from an auditor? Um, so it's, I would say not substantial. Uh, it's not a substantial additional cost to get the SOC 3 if you're doing the SOC 2 uh, which you, you pretty much would have to do the SOC 2 um, as well uh, because it really is just kind of that additional deliverable uh, report. So it's not, it's not a huge add-on, um, but like I said before, it is uh, not as common um, because typically the, the, the clients that, you know, we're providing these to, um, the service organizations, they, they're really trying to provide that full transparent SOC 2 report to their existing clients. And as far as like their marketing and their website, typically they'll include kind of the AICPA SOC branding, which indicates to prospective clients and customers that uh, they do have a SOC 2 report. And then, you know, once the, the customer is ready to engage them or, or purchase their services, the SOC 2 report can be provided. Great, thank you. And then we've got one for you, David, that says, does a compliant ISO 27001 report preclude the need for SOC 2? Well, they're really they're two different compliance guidelines and they're not exactly the same. So again, you have to look back at, you know, why are you, why did you get your 27001 compliance and why are you thinking about getting a SOC 2? If you've got a client, uh, they may be very familiar with the SOC 2. They may have an internal requirement that you have a SOC 2. So, you know, it's going to depend on the situation. But for the most part, we see it's client-driven or prospect-driven. So if your client or prospect says, you know, they want to see a SOC 2, there's a chance you might be able to talk them out of it if you've already got a 27,001. But our experience is they kind of have a standard 
uh, way they do business, especially depending on the relative sizes of the organization. So if it's a large, a large organization you're uh, trying to contract with and you're a small organization, they're typically going to make you get a SOC 3. Great, thank you very much. And then, Mike, we have one last question for you. Um, and that question is, what is the process for doing SOC 2 alongside High Trust? Yeah, so in this case, um, there, there are many offerings out there that will kind of combine both of those. Uh, Clearview specifically, we have a partner organization which is uh, certified to perform the high trust exercise, and then we basically partner with them throughout the high trust audit to collect the evidence we need to also provide the SOC 2. So there's a lot of um, efficiencies to be gained as a service organization to do both at the same time because of the overlap in the types of evidence and the controls and requests that are required of that. So, um, you know, a lot of companies, like I said, will, will kind of, uh, you know, do both of those at the same time. Great, fantastic. Well, that is all the questions that we've got for today. Um, I wanna thank both of our presenters for the time that they've spent. Um, so if you'd like to discuss anything further with either David or Mike, their contact information is on the screen now. So thank you for all your great questions and for joining us for our SOC 2 webinar today. We will be sending the recording out to you tomorrow. If you're looking for security tips or the latest cybersecurity news, follow Astendio and Clearview Group on Twitter, or you can find us on our websites. Thank you very much. Good day.